Good morning. You're welcome to St. Paul Lutheran Church and School for worship today. It is the first Sunday in November, and so we celebrate All Saints Day. Um, It always falls on November 1st, All Saints Day does, but today, it's the first Sunday in November, is November 1st. So, as we celebrate those whom Jesus has called as his own and given them his holiness and righteousness and calls them his saints, That's what we think of today. We think of those past and those present. We are saints in God's kingdom. We also remember those who have come before us and lived the life of faith, showing us what it looks like to follow Jesus. Today we'll remember also those who have died as members of St. Paul in the past year. And so we'll do a commemoration of the faithful departed. And ultimately we remember that because Jesus lives, they and we will live also. Let's sing our first hymn for all the saints. Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved of God, we are made saints by the blood of Jesus, and we rejoice to be numbered with his saints. However, we acknowledge that we remain sinners in how we think, 
speak and behave. Still, in confidence, let us come before our gracious Father, surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, and confess our sins, seeking his forgiveness. Let's pray. Holy God and Father, you called us to obey you in all things and live according to your commands, yet we confess that we have not loved you with all that we are and all that we have. Because of our selfishness, we failed to love others as much as we do ourselves. We've allowed the world's opinion to blind us to the truth of your forgiving love. At times we have set aside our hope in Christ. We easily dwell on the present moment and lose sight of your eternal glory and abiding presence. We admit that our thoughts, words, and deeds have not always been pure. Forgive us. Remind us of our spiritual robes that have been washed and made white in the blood of the Lamb. That We are known to you as your holy children. Amen. Saints of God, know that even as you confess your sins, you are forgiven by our God, the Holy One, who has called you to be holy. Therefore, as a called and ordained servant of Christ in his place and by his authority, I forgive you for all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray. Almighty and everlasting God, you knit together your faithful people at all times and places into one holy communion, the mystical body of your Son, Jesus Christ. Grant us the grace to live as those who have been made holy by the blood of the Lamb, that we may come to the unspeakable joys of heaven, where every tear shall be wiped away. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We rejoice this day as we remember with thanksgiving those who have gone before us with the sign of faith, for they were created by God to offer him praise and thanksgiving. God gave new life to them through holy baptism nourished them in the company of his people at his holy table. And in his mercy, 
summoned them to himself so that they may continue in joyful service to him forever. And so we remember those who have died and have gone to Christ this past year. Ruth Wessenberg. Jesus told his disciples, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Victor Barnaby. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Francis Shackley. For I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Jean Moeller. Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me. For you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all the day long. Waldemar Neisch. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make your paths straight. Marilyn Byer. For I am not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. Deborah Gustitis. Jesus said, In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself. Where I am, you may be also. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. We also name all those others who we know who have gone to be with the Lord. From Revelation, I have heard a voice from heaven saying, Write this, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Blessed indeed, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, for their deeds follow them. Almighty God, in joyful expectation of eternal life with you, we remember all those loved ones who have gone before us in faith and now rejoice with that multitude which no man can number, with whom in the Lord Jesus Christ we are one forevermore. We give you thanks for the gift of faith you worked in them, and encouraged by their witness, we hold fast to the certainty of your promise of eternal life in your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Salvation belongs to our God. A reading from the seventh chapter of the New Testament book, The Revelation to St. John. After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders addressed me, saying, 
Who are these, clothed in white robes, and from where have they come? I said to him, Sir, you know. And he said to me, These are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them, for any, or, nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will guide them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. This is the word of the Lord. The epistle reading is from 1 John the third chapter, beginning with the first verse. See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God, and so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. This is the word of the Lord. Our gospel reading for this morning comes from Matthew chapter 5. Seeing the crowds, Jesus went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. He opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive, receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you 
When others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account, rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. This is the Gospel of the Lord. We join together in confessing our faith in our triune God with so many who have gone before us and with one another today. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Good morning. I wonder if you recognize this place. I sure do. Or places like it. I've spent a lot of time here. I have a lot of friends here. Over the years that I've been pastor at St. Paul, we've had many gatherings around grave sites here. People used to people used to come to cemeteries more often than they do now. It's not so much a thing people would come and they bring flowers to, uh, to place on a grave, to rem remember somebody. Besides the services here, when we would lay someone to rest, people would come and, and take care of a grave site or, or come and just sit and pray and remember. It's not done so much anymore. People have different ideas about burial now, and, and a lot of people, they are cremated, they have their ashes scattered, maybe 
maybe at their cottage up north or uh, on the lake where they always like to fish. Um, some place with special memories. And, and I get that. I, I understand that. But you know, Christians, Christians have burial places for a reason. I, I wonder if you, if you know that. It's not, it's not mandatory, but, but there's a reason why Christians have a tradition of burial. You know, some people believe, some people have this idea that the body is, is bad, really, that it's, it's weak and it's broken, but the spirit is good. And so, and so at last, at the end of our life, the body is worn out and people say, well, you know, it's not so bad to, to, uh, to leave the body behind. And really, the important thing is the spirit that is with Christ. And then and there other people, there are other faiths that, that have the idea that the body is just, just a shell, uh, just a temporary residence, and we leave it behind and don't need it anymore. But that's not, that's not right either. Now, actually, what God teaches us about the body is that he created the body as a really good thing. Adam and Eve, when they were body and spirit, that was perfect. It was just how God wanted it to be. We broke that, of course, by our sin. We see many consequences in our own bodies of the brokenness of the world. And yet, and yet God says he's going to do something really good. He's going to He's going to fix up our bodies just as he did with Jesus. When Jesus rose from the dead and had a glorified body, we will also. So when Christians come to a place like this, to a cemetery, when Christians come to a cemetery, they are a bit like, like people coming to, to uh, a store that is about to unveil the brand new, most amazing new cell phone that you've got to have, right? And they wait for those doors to open so that they can see what it's going to be like and have it for themselves. That's us. When we come to a cemetery, we don't just come to remember and think about the past, or think sad thoughts. We come to the cemetery as people waiting for when these graves will open and we will see something new, something new brand new that God does when he brings body and spirit back together to make us one with him forever in his house. Let's sit down over here and, and think about that. So our text for us to think about today on this All Saints Day is from the Revelation to St. John the aging Apostle John, the last of the apostles still living. Uh, he's in his 90s. He's living on the island of Patmos. He's in, in exile, uh, exiled by the, by the emperor, and uh, not quite by himself, but feeling probably pretty isolated as everybody of his generation is gone. And he receives a vision from God of the end times. Uh, of what, what God is doing behind the scenes. And he records it for us. Now here in his seventh chapter, he says, After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. And they fell on their faces before the throne and they worshiped God saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. And then one of the elders addressed me saying, Who are these clothed in white robes and where have they, from where have they come? I said to him, Sir, you know. And he said to me, these are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Just think about this. John gets to see a glimpse of heaven. And what did he see? I, I really don't want to disappoint you. I, I hope you understand. But John did not see what, what you always tell me you want to see. When you talk about 
getting to heaven, you talk about, ah, that's when you're going to see your mom. That's when you're going to see the, the child that you lost. That's when you're going to see a, a particular person that you, that you have a hole in your heart. You've been missing so much since they passed away. John doesn't say that. John is aging. He's the last of the apostles. He does not say that he sees the other apostles there again. He, he has lost many friends in the persecution. He does not mention that he sees any one of them. John, uh, surely by this time, his parents are long gone. His grandparents, uh, his, his wife, he does not mention seeing them. In fact, it's, it's a little uncertain. Is John seeing the heaven as it is at that moment uh, in his time or heaven as it is at the very end of time? If it's the second option, then he, then you're there and he could see you, but he doesn't mention that either. What does John see? He sees an uncountable multitude of people, billions of believers in Jesus, all of them in white robes. And, and how does he feel? You know, when when I see a huge crowd of people, when I am at a stadium with 100,000 people, there's, that's kind of a lonely feeling in a way, isn't it? When you're, when you're in a huge crowd of people and they don't know you and you don't know them, that's sort of isolating. But, but John says, these are people who all know him. And he knows them all, no matter how many there are. Jesus has said, that, that we would be one with one another as, as the Father is one with the Son. And we would love one another as the Father and the Son love one another. And as we, and as God loves us and we love God. That's the oneness that we would have in heaven. These people that John sees, they all know each other and all love one another. And so John does not see billions of strange faces. John sees billions of people whom he know, who he will know and love, and who all know him and love him. Who are these people? They're from every nation, tribe, people, and language, and yet they can all understand one another. Not, not even that they can all speak the same language, but that they can all be understood and, and comprehend each other. No, no, no longer isolated inside their own thoughts. Who are these people? They are, they are from every time. And there are many things that you, know, you would think in the, in the movies when you travel to a different time, all these things we don't understand, we have to explain to each other. None of that, because they all share the most important event in history together, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has raised them from death. These people, they are all believers in Christ, and so they are brothers and sisters of one another. So John is arriving in his vision at his family reunion and welcomed there. And these people, who are they? They are those who have come out of the great tribulation. The Greek word for tribulation, literally, it comes from the word for a squeeze, for, for compression, a time of of getting squeezed, of getting getting uh, pushed. Do you know what that's like? It was not only the the intense persecution that the first believers went through for three hundred years, but it is uh, the kinds of squeezing that we go through in every century, in every age, and in every nation. The the pressure upon us to doubt, uh, the pressures of illness and poverty of hunger and, and uh, division and strife. We come through this life being squeezed all the time. And these are those who have come out of that, that time of pressure all the time. We believe from the time that Christ ascended to heaven until the time that he returns, that is the great tribulation. That's the time of the squeezing of the church. And yet they have come out of that into a place of, of freedom and fulfillment and refreshment and resurrection. They have endured debt 
and work and weariness. They've endured quarantine and loneliness and isolation. And now, although they are in this great crowd, they are no longer alone. There is no longer a hole in their heart. They, they no longer desire to see just that one person, but one after another, after another, after another person. All their siblings in Christ, whom they had no previous chance to know, now they can know fully and be fully known, as Paul says. These are the ones who have, it, the elder says, washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb. They've been purified. They've been cleansed. They've been every stain of their life erased. Every wound healed. Every sin, every sadness, every loss, every failure forgotten. And now, in verse 15, he says, Therefore, they are before the throne of God, and they serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd. And he will guide them to springs of living water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. These people are not, as they're sometimes pictured in cartoons, or in maybe in our imagination also, they are, they're not sitting on clouds in, uh, with harps, strumming harps, uh, in this most boring vision of heaven ever, they are serving God in his temple. They are following the lamb, their shepherd, like a flock, all these in white robes, like a, like a flock, fl following Jesus and talking to one another in fellowship, sharing food and drink and being refreshed. What's that remind you of? Maybe... Maybe this scripture, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. You have often cited the, that verse to me, many of you, as a favorite scripture because it's your image of what you most desire from God, that he would lead you and protect you and provide for you. And that is exactly what is pictured here in John's revelation, that your time with Christ will be in heaven. It's true now that Christ leads you now and protects and provides for you here. But oh, so much more true for those who lie here in this place. Those whose bodies lie here in this cemetery who await the day when they, their bodies and spirits will be reunited and we will see the fulfillment of all God's promises. How foolish we are. We, we grieve for Grandpa because he didn't get to attend your wedding. But, but he's gone ahead of you to the marriage feast of the Lamb. What a wedding that must be. And we, we feel sorry for a wife or mother who was taken from her family. And yet she walks with a family, uh, a, infinite family waiting for the rest of the family members to arrive. We, we regret the child that died before she could go to school, but she sits at Jesus' feet, learning, rejoicing in Jesus' voice, hearing from him all that she needs and desires to know. And we weep for the, for the young boy who didn't, didn't ever get to take a girl to the prom. But here he walks with Christ in heaven. And, and here the, the girl who would have been his date, perhaps, she walks with Christ in robes of white like a bride with her bridegroom. We grieve things of earth. We grieve these temporary images, these tiny fragments of what heaven might be like. But God holds for us and for all of those who are waiting with us for that day, he holds for us the ultimate fulfillment of all those things that we see now only in part. Do you ever come to this place or a place like this? Do you ever come to a cemetery and just spend time thinking? We come here sometime to be sad. We some, sometimes come here just to remember. 
Christians have graves for a reason. Christians have graves not to remember the past, but we have these graves here to hold for us the promise of our future. Our future together as these graves are opened, just as, just as Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James, they came to Jesus' grave to prepare, uh, to, to finish the preparation of his body for burial. But they came to Jesus' grave to a great surprise on Easter morning. We come here because we know we will also one day have that same surprise. It will come like a thief in the night suddenly. But what a wonderful day when this cemetery is no longer open for business, but it is opened and will never close again. Amen. And now may the peace of God that surpasses all understanding keep your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Standing with all the saints before the throne of God and the Lamb, we join together in prayer. Mighty and eternal God, we remember the saints and martyrs of every generation who trusted in you in the face of fear and danger. We pray that when we face persecution and trial in our own time, we also be steadfast in faith. Today we remember all of us who are saints because you have washed us in baptism and you have given us new life that death cannot overcome. We thank you for calling us your own. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God, you established the church and you protected us through this many years. Can you to pour out your spirit and grace so that we would accomplish all that you call us to do also proclaim your saving name to every place that you send and use us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, we pray for those who lead in our government, nationally and locally. We desire that they would pursue justice and that they would act with humility and honor for the good of all people. Give wisdom to all who vote this week. Bless its result. And our nation may elect our leaders peacefully and orderly. No matter who is elected, we know that they are human and will often fail. Remind us that you will never fail us, Father. Give your grace to all who are elected and appointed. Lead them and us to trust in you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of the living, we rejoice that you have rescued us from the power of death and raised us in Christ to dwell with him in everlasting life. Give comfort to those who grieve, including the Gussoff family at the death of Don's father, Charlie. We pray that they would also trust in your promises of the resurrection of the dead and the life that is to come. Lord, also fill the dying with your peace including Marge Gildner. I pray that as she falls asleep here, she would awake in your glory 
rise victoriously with us on the last day. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God, you have made us your children, and you continue to guard us as your own possession. According to your will, give health and peace to our nation. Give healing to the sick, calm to the troubled, patience to those facing sorrow and struggle. Hear us especially on behalf of Don, Nola, Jerry, Greg, Ed, and Jeremiah with cancer. Bring healing and restoration to Don and Liz, Kevin, Carol, Jerry, and Susan, Keith, Mary, Christy, Judy, Branson, and Charlene. And continue to give your strength to Sally and Jim and Mike. And they all trust in you and your promises as they ask that your will would be done. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord of all, show your kindness to the poor and your compassion to those who suffer injustice. Use us to show your love and caring for their needs. Deliver us from racism and prejudice. Help us to acknowledge the life we each have as your created people that we are commonly redeemed in Christ our Savior. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Mighty God, eternal King, bring us to the day when every tear shall be wiped away from our eyes. We shall hunger and thirst no more, knowing you. Now by faith we, we yearn for the day when we will see you face to face until the day that light appears. Keep us in faith in you. We would follow you all the days of our lives. We pray this through Jesus Christ, your Son, who has also taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen.
this is just a, a little note of reminder. We understand that during this COVID time, a lot of people are very isolated and alone. Uh, a lot of, there's a lot of stress and depression. We're really concerned about, about your spirit. Um, I'm going to play a little video, just a reminder to you that there are members of our congregation who are trained Stephen ministers. They're not, they're not uh, psychologists or not, um, not counselors necessarily, but they are people to come alongside, people to pray with you and listen, people who are prepared to understand and, and uh, be a part of what's going on in your life. Watch this and think about, would you maybe benefit from having somebody beside you? Uh, take a look at the connect form. And as you sign in with that, there's a space there to say, I would like to talk about having a Stephen minister of my own. The thing I appreciated most about my Stephen minister um, was that she showed up. He was there for me and with me, and it was a very, very special relationship. I really looked forward to that one hour, an hour, I guess, of sanity in a time of, of uh, the world upside down. I really did need a miracle, and my miracle came in the form of my Stephen Minister. It was the interaction and I think the sort of the Christian connection that really uh, made me feel comfortable to actually open up. I think of my Stephen minister as a representative of Jesus for me and as a representative of the church for me. She didn't judge me. She didn't tell me what to do. She just really walked side by side with me. It wasn't about preaching. It was about healing and and the church being there. The easiest way to say it was my Stephen minister helped me to take a lot of things that were in my head, bring them down to my heart, and then bring them out and put them in the hands of the Lord. I'll see her eyes that she's ready to listen. And I'll be like, I can't wait to share with you. This is what happened this week. This is what happened. It seemed like I could go on again with life. There was hope again. Sometimes I would look at her and I would just almost see God, you know, because she was just, she was grace, she was faith, she was trust, she was love. She was all of the things that God wants us to be. God placed her in this ministry for a reason. God called her to be a Stephen minister. And because of that, that made me more comfortable to just share whatever I needed to share. And it wasn't a burden to her. And the Stephen minister, the Stephen ministry program, not only saved my life, but changed my life. And I'll forever be grateful to having had a Stephen minister. After having had a Stephen minister, my life is unbelievably different. If you're under anything like the pressure that I was under then, wouldn't you like to be where I am now? You can, you can get there if you take on a Stephen minister. But you can't have the one that I have.
Standing with all the saints before the throne of God and the Lamb, we join together in prayer. Okay, and then, and then benediction, turn for the benediction. Take two, and then the next thing. I just left it running. I know. Okay. Sorry. I don't have what I need. <laughs> there you go. This. I just bumped this camera, so I gotta. Okay. Should we let the train pass? Yeah. There will be a brief pause while the train is blowing its horn down the street.